the biggest Ponzi schemes in history. The phrase Ponzi scheme was coined in 1920 after a con artist, Charles Ponzi, swindled people of a total of $20 million. Ponzi scheme involves receiving money from people under the guise of investing it and promising them high returns. In reality, this money is not invested. Instead, old investors are paid with money from new investors. This is why it is often called robbing Peter to pay Paul. Ponzi scheme originated from Charles Ponzi, but much bigger ones have been perpetrated in the last century such that Charles now appears so little. Today we will review two of the biggest Ponzi schemes in history. First on the list is the Ponzi scheme orchestrated by Bernard Madoff. Madoff was an American finance consultant convicted of defrauding thousands of investors of $65 billion in 17 years. Madoff was born in Queens, New York on the 29th of April 1938. His father was a plumber before both his parents became financiers. His parents founded a brokerage firm, Gibraltar Securities, which the Securities and Exchange Commission later shut down. Madoff attended Hofstra University, where he got a bachelor's degree in political science in 1960. While in school, he married his longtime girlfriend, Ruth Alpern. He then decided to follow in his parents' footsteps by pursuing a career in the finance industry. He began trading penny stocks with the $5,000 he earned from menial jobs. He also convinced his family and friends to invest with him but the investment failed during the Kennedy slide of 1962 when the stock market crashed, and many stockbrokers had to leave the market. The failed market left Madoff in so much debt that his father-in-law had to help him offset them. He then took a short break from the finance world. Later in the 1980s, he formed the Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities. The company included a trading segment and an investment advisory business, which Madoff claimed was legitimate initially. The company helped Madoff make a name for himself in the finance world. He soon became the chairman of the National Association of Securities Dealer Automated Quotations NASDAQ, in 1990 and developed market systems that brought about electronic trading. Madoff's company grew rapidly and it appeared so exclusive that the public believed anyone would be lucky to invest with them. In the 90s, the company controlled 10 to 15% of all New York Stock Exchange trading orders. What investors didn't know was that Madoff's reputable business was, in fact, a Ponzi scheme. He attracted investors by promising them exorbitant returns and diverted their funds into a personal account at Chase Manhattan Bank instead of investing them. He then paid old clients with money from new clients, and all Madoff had to do was send clients falsified account statements showing high investment returns. These account statements encouraged more people to invest with the company, and the scam cycle continued. These fraudulent activities continued for 17 years until 2008, when the wall of lies came crashing down. The 2008 Great Recession in the US drove several investors to request a withdrawal of their investments. The total amount requested was $7 billion, but at that point, Madoff barely had $300 million in his account. On the 10th of December 2008, he confessed to his wife and two sons, Mark and Andrew, that the investment arm of the company was a complete fraud, and it had gone bankrupt. He had planned to gather more money from new investors to distribute among his workers, then shut down the firm. But the recession disrupted his plans. His sons, who were senior managers in the trading arm of the company, immediately reported their father to the authorities. The following day, the FBI stormed Madoff's office to arrest him. His bail was set at $10 million, which he paid and was set free thereafter. However, he was placed on a 24-hour house arrest. On the 12th of March 2009, he pled guilty to 11 criminal counts, including fraud, money laundering, and perjury. It was revealed that he had defrauded over 40,000 people across 125 countries at the time of his arrest. 
On the 29th of June, he was sentenced to 150 years in jail and was ordered to pay $200 billion in restitution. However, the company was bankrupt, making the payment impossible. Madoff served his sentence until April 2021, when he died of natural causes in prison at 83. His Ponzi scheme left a permanent mark on his victims. While several went bankrupt, many others lost their lives. René Thierry Magon de la Villuchette, a French financial consultant who lost $1.4 billion of his clients' funds to Madoff, committed suicide by slashing his wrists. 65-year-old former U.S. Army Major William Foxton, whose group lost $1.5 billion to Madoff's Ponzi scheme, also killed himself with gunshots to the head in 2009. He left a suicide note explaining that he committed suicide because of the money he lost. Madoff's son, Mark, also committed suicide in 2010 by hanging himself with a dog leash on the second anniversary of his father's arrest. 56-year-old Charles Murphy, who ran a hedge fund that lost $7.5 billion to Madoff's company, fell into depression and was placed on medication. Unfortunately, he lost the battle with depression in 2017 as he jumped to his death from the 24th floor of the New York Hotel. The second Ponzi scheme we are examining today is Greater Ministries International, established by Gerald Payne. While the amount of money stolen here is much lesser than Madoff's, this Ponzi scheme remains one of the most shocking in history because it surrounds the institution of religion. Gerald Payne founded Greater Ministries International in 1993. It was a Christian evangelical ministry that propagated anti-government ideologies and was used as a front for a Ponzi scheme. Payne told his congregation that God gave him the inspiration for Greater Ministries in the middle of the night, 27 years before he established it. He claimed he ignored the message until 1988 when a Christian brother approached him with a message from God that said, Gerald, do what I told you to do. So he decided it was time to do as instructed. Payne and his wife, Betty, teamed up with Haywood Don Hall to establish Greater Ministries. They promised to double any amount received from their non-existent investment in gold and diamond in Liberia and other precious materials all around the world. Their ground for the business was the Bible verse Luke 6.38 that read, Give, and it shall be given unto you. They convinced people to mortgage their houses and sell properties to invest with them. Unfortunately for the investors, the church didn't invest the money and only paid old investors with money from new investors. Elders of the church also encouraged believers to invest, while they received 5% of the money invested by the people they brought in and tagged it gas money. The church painted a good image by contributing to projects that provided accommodation for jobs for the homeless and addicts. Behind the curtains? The church was just a bank for keeping money fraudulently received from the public. The church's headquarters, located in Tampa, had 14 safes, two vaults, and a money counting room. By 1995, the investment group had grown so big that authorities began to suspect it was a pyramid scheme. In September 1995, a state agency issued a cease and desist order against the ministry. Instead of suspending operations in compliance with the order, Payne changed the ministry's name to Faith Promises. The law began to catch up with Payne and his associates in November 1997 when an elder of the church, Henry Talbert, was charged with fraud and other finance-related crimes in another pyramid scheme. He was convicted of all charges and sentenced to 10 years in jail. Likewise, a former employee of Greater Ministries, Jonathan Strotter, was arrested for operating a different pyramid scheme which he defrauded people of $14 million within seven months in 1997. Strotter accepted a plea deal to cooperate with authorities to investigate Greater Ministries. The intense investigation into the ministry didn't stop it from continuing its fraudulent activities though. However, the ministry suffered a huge blow in 1998 when state regulators shut down a fraudulent bank that coincidentally housed a vast amount of the ministry's money. 
this affected the ministry so much that it couldn't afford to pay old investors even though it was getting new investors. Federal authorities concluded their investigation into the ministry in March 1999. Seven greater ministry leaders, including Gerald Payne, Betty Payne, Don Hall, and Henry Talbert, were charged with 17 counts of money laundering, fraud, and other crimes. Investigations revealed that they had defrauded 18,000 people of an estimated $500 million. Investigators also discovered that the ministry planned to buy an island where they intended to keep an arsenal of weapons including explosives, grenade launchers, machine guns, and surveillance balloons. In fact, Payne always had a gun in his boots and another in his car glove compartment. Two of the defendants, James Chambers and Andrew Krishak, pled guilty to the charges. Krishak, who cooperated with authorities, got a 30-month sentence and two years of probation, while Chambers refused to cooperate and was sentenced to five years in jail with two years of probation. On the 22nd of March 2001, the other five defendants were convicted of all charges. Gerald was sentenced to 27 years in jail. Betty received 12 years and seven months imprisonment. Don Hall was handed a 15-year sentence David Whitefield was sentenced to 19 years, and Henry Talbert got 19 and a half years in jail. Despite the gravity of their crimes, Gerald and Betty insisted they didn't do anything wrong and that investors gifted them the money because of their belief. Shockingly, some of their congregations still stormed the courtroom to show their support for the couple during their trial. Bernard Madoff and Greater Ministries International Ponzi schemes had two major things in common. They promised people exorbitant returns for their investments and people trusted them blindly. Promises of extremely high returns should always be a red flag when investing. Also, the only reason to trust an investment company is if it practices transparency. Many Ponzi schemes may very well be in operation as we speak, so it's advisable to consider these factors before investing your hard-earned money. Thank you for watching and we hope you enjoyed the video. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Likewise, turn on notifications so you never miss a video.